Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening tips to help improve our environment. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Ellen Zakos, a wonderful author of many books on gardening. Ellen leads foraging walks and also teaches at the New York Botanical Garden, where she received her certification in commercial horticulture as well as ethnobotany. And Ellen has um, recently uh, written a book called Backyard Foraging, 65 Familiar Plants You Didn't Know You Could Eat. So Ellen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kim. This is a, a terrific book. Um, I think has a tremendous appeal to seasoned gardeners and novice folks, people who um, don't garden at all and just want to find some interesting things to forage, either in urban areas, suburban areas, rural areas. So really, thank you for writing the book. It's it's a wonderful resource. Well, and, I, it was the most fun I, <laughs> I've had writing a book yet. I really enjoyed oh, that's, it. That's terrific. Yeah. And you've done, um, done the reader a service by bringing breaking the book up in particular categories and explaining not only about um, the particular plant and the parts of the plant that one can eat, but also how to forage for the plant, particular cautions, etc. And um, your basic categories are leaves, flowers and fruit, nuts and seeds, roots, tubers and rhizomes, and superstars, uh, followed by a section on mushrooms. So I'd like to see if we could maybe talk about um, how you came to write the book and then get into some of these categories. So how did you come to write this book? Well, I came to write the book because two of the things that I love most in the world, aside from people and my cats, are food and, and gardening. So it seemed sort of the natural meeting of these two areas. Um, I really... I love food. I love not only to eat, but food preservation and cooking is really my hobby. I I make my own wine. I make jams and jellies. I do weird experimental things. And gardening and making things grow is another great love of mine. So when a friend of mine started talking about foraging, it just really captured my interest. And I I dove into the topic um, full heartedly and read everything I could get my hands on and started taking classes. And, and now it's really a part of my life and I wanted to share it. That's great. And you, you do something interesting, which is you cover uh, both native plants, uh, exotic plants, and then those nasty bad boy invasive exotic plants. So there, there's a lot of great information in here. Um, could you name one native plant that you're particularly fond of uh, as an edible and, and why it's one of your favorites? You know, of the, all the plants in this book, and, and many of them are delicious, and I don't know why this is, but all of my favorites are natives. And I, it's not on purpose because I am really an equal opportunity gardener. <laughs> I am just as happy to have a plant from Japan in my garden as I am to have a plant from, you know, New York State or New Hampshire. But, um, but, but my, I think the most delicious ones to, to my palate happen to be natives. Mm-hmm. Um, m- my favorite edible plant of all is the common milkweed. Oh, Wow. Uh, you know, it's got so many delicious parts to it that really take you through a long season of availability. Um, you know, you've got the shoots coming up in spring. You've got the unopened flower buds in early summer. You've got the open flower buds a little bit later on, and then you've got the immature pods even after that. Each one of those is a, is a delicious and unique taste. Uh, there are also things like the, um, I mean, just my favorites, the Apios Americana, Hopness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful tuber. I mean, better than potatoes and and service berries. A, a, a fruit that rivals blueberries surpasses them, in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. These are all native plants. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We really lucked out in that department in this country. That that's terrific. And yeah. um, common milkweed uh, for our listeners, uh, Sclepia syriaca is the botanical name. Mm-hmm. This is particularly a uh, particularly important plant because it's a host plant for monarch butterflies. So that's a very uh, topical um, selection you've made. Is there something about the common milkweed that's more appealing than, say, swamp milkweed or any of the other milkweeds, butterfly weed, etc.? Well, the only one that I know of to be absolutely safe to eat is the common milkweed. Okay. And, and it's good that you brought this up now because um, one thing I must say, and any responsible forager will always say, is 
Never eat anything you're not 100% sure mm-hmm. of. So if you're walking down the street and you say, hmm, that's a milkweed, but is it Asclepias syriaca or Asclepias incarnata? I don't know. Swamp milkweed? Come, don't eat it. If you don't mm-hmm. know, don't eat it. Do not be tempted or seduced by tales of deliciousness until you can ID it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Don't put it in your mouth. So a lot of people know that there are, of course, you know, chemicals in milkweeds, um, uh-huh. which Monarch caterpillars have adapted to. Hmm. Um, how, how is this plant edible given those toxins? Well, first of all, we have to remember that what's toxic to another animal or an insect is not necessarily toxic to a human being. Mm-hmm. You know, cows eat grass and really that's not so great for humans. Different, different, different physiologies and different metabolisms work with different plant chemicals. Um, but uh, generally speaking, the milky white sap that you see when you break any part of the milkweed plant um, can be eliminated by a quick parboil. Okay. Um, and then you continue to cook it in another way, and that eliminates that that eliminates the bitter taste, which is usually indicative of the phytochemicals that you know then make the the monarch caterpillar unpalatable to the bird that. Mm-hmm might be thinking about swooping down and eating it up. Mm-hmm. So those those bitter compounds are contained in that white sap, which you are eliminating by a quick parboil and then however else you choose to actually cook the milkweed, whether it's roasting it or sauteing it or boiling it further. Okay. And what what's your favorite way to cook it? Well, it cha- you know, I keep trying different things. I would say that at this point in time, I had a really great year last year with the immature pods. And what I started doing was, um, you know how you would bread um, a cutlet, you'd dip it in some batter and then in some breadcrumbs? Mm-hmm. I would do that. And then in a little bit of olive oil, a pan saute. And what that does is it makes the outside very crispy. And then the inside, which is filled with these white sort of proto seeds. By the time the seeds turn brown, um, the pod is too mature. But when it's young and immature, those white proto seeds get sort of soft and creamy and cheesy and you bite into it and it's just delicious. So a saute after dipping them in breadcrumbs, that's my number one way of eating milkweed pods right now. That sounds pretty good. It's very good. <laughs> I'll you, be sure to send you a picture. <laughs> and you obviously um, like amelanchier, serviceberry. Uh, that's yeah. one of my favorites, too. Um, what are some other native fruits that you're particularly fond of and perhaps some things that people might not be so familiar with? Well, in the first place, I just want to say something about amelanchier. I, I don't understand why more people don't, don't eat that fruit. Mm-hmm. It's so delicious. It is. Um, and so easy to grow. And I, I think a lot of people, and perhaps understandably so, are afraid to eat something that's unknown. But the amelanchier is just a, a really wonderful fruit that I think deserves wider appreciation. Um, spice bush is another native berry that I love. Um, the Latin name is Lindera benzoin. And it's an interesting plant for, for many reasons. But First of all, because it's dioecious, male and female plants are separate. Mm-hmm. So you need to have both to collect the fruit. Now, some people make a tea from the leaves, and that's wonderful, but a tea is not a food I can really sink my teeth into. Um, so I collect the berries, dry them, and use them as a spice. And I, I tell you, Kim, the flavor is almost addictive. It's like a combination of allspice and pepper. It works well with with sweet foods, with savory foods. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it, it's a taste that kind of haunts you. You've tasted it and, and you just want more of it. It's mm-hmm. really, really good. That, that's, uh, I have tasted it and it is delicious. I, oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah. And how about some other fruits that folks might not be familiar with? I'm, I'm thinking of one, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about it, um, passion flower, maypop. Okay. Well, it, depending on what part of the country you're in, you probably can find passion flowers pretty easily. They, they say that they're hardy to zone six. I think that's pushing it a little bit. I can find them reliably as, you know, North Carolina-ish. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but even though you can grow them in zone six, they don't always have a long enough season to fruit right. in zone six. So I would say primarily this is a plant for the warmer parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who grow passion flower as an ornamental vine in colder climates may occasionally have it fruit for them, but then they kind of get disappointed because you open up those fruits and they're absolutely hollow. Have you ever seen that happen? Yes, yes. Yeah. But the, the kind that produce edible fruit, um, you, you open it up and you, you, you look at it and you're like, what am I supposed to do with this? Because there's a lot of seeds inside. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I think the best way um, to take advantage of the natural sweetness of this fruit is, is to make a juice from it. Um, okay. So you, you cut the fruit in half, you scoop the seeds out and the pulp in a shallow pan and, um, and the pulp is white, the seeds are red and just discard the skin, add just a tiny amount of water to cover them, simmer, mash and strain. And you get the pure taste of the juice, which is quite delicious. You can, um, eat the pulp that surrounds the seeds the same way you would a pomegranate. Mm -hmm. but it's an awful lot of work. Okay. Okay. And, um, you also mentioned viburnum. And yeah. of course, there are many species of viburnum. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite as far well, as um, being edible? Yeah, not all viburnums are delicious. Yes. So it's it's pretty <laughs> important that you get the right ones. The one that's called high bush cranberry is mm -hmm. viburnum trilobum. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other viburnums that look very similar, but actually um, smell terrible, sort of like dirty socks and, <laughs> and taste pretty much like dirty socks. So um, you, you don't want to go for that one, which is Viburnum opulus, which unfortunately looks very similar to Viburnum trilobum. It's actually a question of identifying the glands on the leaves. Um, so if you, if you buy a plant and it's correctly labeled, that'll give you a, a good head start. Mm -hmm. Even though it's called high bush cranberry, it's not actually related to the cranberry, but it does have that same red jewel tone to it and uh, a nice tart flavor. So it's terrific in jellies. And it also happens to ripen at just about the right time for Thanksgiving and Christmas. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really um, nice way to use a, a native berry, foraged berry in your holiday meals. Oh, that's a great idea. And some of the things you're describing, certainly service berry and then the fruits of viburnum, trilobum, um, are relished by birds. So what mm. you're thinking about um, saving a little bit for nature? When you forage mm -hmm. ethically, what are your suggestions in terms of how to do that? I'm glad you asked that. Um, because foraging tends to make me greedy. I confess, you know, you see something and you get excited and you know how delicious it's and you want more and more, but slow down because in the first place, however much you pick, you're going to have to do something with. So you're going to get all those berries home. And if you're not going to eat them right away, you're going to have to wash and freeze them or make jam. So it, Whenever you're foraging, don't let it be a case of, you know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Remember that you need to leave some behind, not only for the birds and the bears and the raccoons, but also so that the plant can propagate itself. Because right. inside each of those fruits is one or more seeds. And and that's how the plant propagates itself. So, so a good general rule is to never take more than one third of what you find okay. so that you leave a third for the wildlife mm -hmm. and a third for propagation. Mm -hmm. And I would think that's especially true for plants where you're eating the roots or tubers or rhizomes. Oh, you know, even uh, that's that I would have a different rule for that, okay. honestly. Yeah. Uh, depending on what it is, of course, if it's something like um, Jerusalem artichoke, where mm -hmm. if you leave behind, you know, like the piece of one small tuber, it will grow a whole new plant. I don't think you need to worry about so much. But if it's something that is less vigorous in its growth habit, um, I would certainly be I would say lower that to, you know, never take more than a quarter of what's there. Okay. And, and when you're talking about things like um, fiddlehead ferns, Matuchia mm -hmm. struthiopteris, mm -hmm. um, I would not ever recommend taking more than two or three fiddleheads from any one plant. Okay. I, it really depends on the the strength or the growth habit, how aggressive mm -hmm. that particular plant is. I mean, milkweed, you couldn't, you couldn't kill it with Roundup. So <laughs> not that you should try, oh, um, but you know, uh, you can, you can go ahead and harvest the heck out of that plant. But, but with others, mm -hmm. you really need to be more careful. 
So you've um, you mentioned before Apios Americana ground oh. nut um, yeah. as one of your favorites. So describe a little bit to our listeners how that grows and how you would forage that particular plant. Okay. Well, um, groundnut or hopness, Apios americana, is a plant that likes moist soils. So I usually find it, oh, and be careful because it often grows in conjunction with poison ivy. Oh, dear. Uh, which, you know, also, well, poison ivy likes moist soils, but it'll grow just about anywhere. Um, Apios americana, I often find growing or, along river banks or lake banks, the shores of lakes. And when it's not in bloom, it's really unassuming. It's got very thin vines. It's a relative of wisteria, but where wisteria can get to be as you know thick as your forearm, um, the stems of, of apios are, are thread-like mm -hmm. in thickness. Um, and they have nice pinnate leaves. When the plant is in bloom, the smell of the flower will alert you to the, the fact that it's blooming before you even see the flower. It's, it's a, a lovely, strong perfume. Mm -hmm. um, but the edible part that's so delicious is the underground tuber. And mm -hmm. these radiate from the base of the plant in chains. They're, they're little small fruits anywhere from the size of, oh gosh, I'm blanking. But they, they can get the, the ones that are the best size for eating are just about the size of a ping pong ball. Okay. They can get to be larger or smaller. And they're each connected by uh, a piece of underground tissue. So they really form these long chains. And what I like to do is in fall, after the top of the plant has gone dormant, I um, dig up a whole bunch of the tubers, harvest 25% of the right size, and then just replant all the rest of them. Okay. And that kind of rejuvenates the clump and allows me to take some home and... It, the, the plant itself is not going to miss a beat because those are, are very vigorous growing tubers. Okay, that's great to know. And if you really like it, save some of those tubers out and plant them in your own garden in the spring. Plant them at the bottom of a trellis um, and you'll have a beautiful garden plant and something that you can harvest from on a regular basis. That's, that's a great point because a lot of these things, not only can you forage you know, in the wild or city park, but you can also grow at home. I mean, virtually all the ones you've described. Yeah, well, that was the sort of the focus of this book um, was combining those two things because I think a lot of people, although they're fascinated by the idea of foraging, they get nervous about being sure of their identifications. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to bring something home and, and you know, poison their entire family. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, people are afraid, well, what if I don't identify it correctly? If you start by harvesting plants that you already know things that either you bought or you planted or came with your house or something that somebody, you know, everybody knows a dandelion or maybe I shouldn't say that, but things that are familiar to you, it eliminates that fear. And it's a really good way to get introduced into this particular activity of foraging. Mm -hmm. And and grow more native plants from my perspective as well. Right, <laughs> that right. doesn't hurt. Yeah. Another one of your, your favorites that you mentioned is um, wild ginger, Acerum yeah. canadens. Um, talk a little bit about that plant and how one would go about harvesting that. That's a great plant to harvest because when you do it, you're actually helping the plant if you do it properly. Um, the edible part of the wild ginger is the underground stolen. And if you've ever worked in a big clump of wild ginger, you know that when you, you dig up the plants, they're all connected by this network, very shallow network of underground stolons. So the, way, the best way to harvest them is to dig up a couple of clumps that are close together, snip the stolons connecting the plants, replant the plants because you're not disturbing their immediate root systems and then bringing those stolons back into the kitchen. So people say, oh, but if you dig up the roots, you're going to kill the plant. You're not. Mm -hmm. you're, you're just taking that, that connective stolon and using that to cook with and then replanting those plants so that they will continue to grow for you the next season. And, and I think that wild ginger is a, is a beautiful ground, cr ground cover for shade. Mm -hmm. um, it's got lovely matte finish heart-shaped leaves the flowers are totally cool the way they bloom at ground level um and the taste of those stolons is out of this world now i haven't had that what what would you liken the taste to well of course it's called wild ginger so everybody expects it to be like ginger and, and in many respects it is in that it's got spiciness to it and a little bit of heat it works well with both savory and uh, sweet dishes just as 
um, you know, tropical ginger does. But I think that the native ginger has a somewhat darker flavor to it. It's not quite as bright and forward in the mouth. Okay. Um, it combines wonderfully. My, my favorite is, is um, for Thanksgiving this year, I made a pear pie that I spiced with wild ginger and spice bush berries. And that to me is a really classic combination. That, found, that sounds really great. Yeah. Um, another one of the superstar plants that you mention is sassafras. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of us in the Northeast, of course, are, you know, very familiar with that plant. Um, there's a little bit of uh, controversy about um, the potential carcinogenic quality of this plant. So talk a little bit about sassafras and um, share your idea about, about whether we, we should be concerned or not eating it. Okay, I will. And I will preface that by saying... I am not a food scientist. Proceed at your own risk <laughs> and your grown-ups make your own decision. That being said, I eat sassafras with no worries whatsoever. I think um I think it's a lot of hype over nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there are ulterior motives behind the ban on saffron, one of them being that um it actually is a chemical that's used in the production of methamphetamines, I think. And uh, so, oh no, ecstasy, sorry. (laughs) Saffron oil is an ingredient in in ecstasy. I'm not sure we Um, should be sharing that information. (laughs) Well, I don't have the recipe for it, Kim, so I can't really tell you how to make it. But but I think it has a lot, the the ban has a lot more to do with that um, than anything else. The the fact is that saffron occurs in small amounts in lots of other spices like cinnamon and black pepper. So we are not living in a saffron-free world. (laughs) And and the ban, the the studies that the FDA did were were performed on a very concentrated lab-produced saffron oil, which is much stronger than the saffron that's re- released by the sassafras bark. Um, and the amounts that they gave to the animals were more than 10 times higher than what you would consume even if you drank sassafras tea on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So personally, I do not heed those warnings. Um, they have not, the case has not been proven uh, sufficiently to me. But if you are nervous about the idea of eating sassafras, you can do it safely by using the leaves, mm-hmm. not the not the uh, roots or the bark. And the leaves, in fact, are consumed on a regular basis by anybody who makes gumbo and uses true filet. Right. Because the dried leaves of sassafras are ground up into a green powder, and that is filet gumbo, mm-hmm. and that does not contain any saffron. So, so it is perfectly safe um, for anybody to consume. Well, thank you for clearing that up. And, and <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you forage the, um, the roots when you do forage for them, by the way? Well, um, sassafras is a tree that cr- creates a clonal population mm-hmm. just the way aspens do in the West. So you will almost always, I mean, I've never seen just one sassafras. Right. You're always finding suckers growing, mm-hmm. you know, two, three, four feet away from the base of the parent tree. Um, now, if you were cutting down or getting rid of a large sassafras tree, you could remove the root bark and use that. But generally what I do is I just pull up some of the really small um suckers, which okay. are pretty easy to do with your hand when they're about 12 or 18 inches tall. And then I use um, the the entire root piece, which is usually thinner than that of, you know, a pencil, okay. thinner than a pencil. Okay. And, and that I, I clean that gently and then boil those to make an absolutely delicious tea. Oh, that sounds quite good. It's really good. And um, I don't want to tell anybody they should taste it if they're nervous about it, but I would be very sad not to taste that. I think it's a, a wonderful flavor. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my um, favorite uh, moisture-loving plants is, is elderberry, uh, mm. here in Sambucus canadensis. And mm-hmm. um, I'll be darned, every time I taste those berries, they're incredibly tart. That's, that seems to be a, a fruit that needs sugar. But I understand, um, maybe you can talk about the fruit, but also I understand that you can take the flower heads and batter them up and essentially create a fritter. You can. Um, and I got to say, really, what would not taste good 
dipped in batter, <laughs> deep fried, and then sprinkled with sugar. N- nothing. You know, I mean, my my letter opener would be good. I, I um, You can do that. But my favorite thing to do with the flowers is to make elderflower champagne. Ooh. Um, and it's not really champagne. It's it's just barely alcoholic. The, the um, pollen of elderflowers contains a lot of natural yeasts. So you can actually make a gently fermented beverage with elderflowers without adding any additional yeast to it. Um, and it's, it's been popular in Europe for years. In fact, Fanta makes a soda, an, elder, an elderflower soda that they sell in Eastern Europe, which I have got to get my hands on. because I think, hysterical. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, recently we've seen the influx of St. Germain, you know, that elderflower liqueur. yes. So it is not an unknown flavor to the world, but here it, it's just a recent arrival. Um, but I make it every summer. I, I harvest in June and long about July 4th, that beverage is, is ready to drink and it's refreshing and cool and naturally fermented and, and naturally carbonated and it's just delicious. Sounds wonderful. Mm. Uh, another plant that people probably aren't growing in their home gardens, but really should consider if they have the right conditions is our Opuntia species, our prickly pears. Talk a little bit about those and how you use them. Well, you know, so many people think of Opuntias or prickly pears as desert plants, but the fact is they're native to 48 of our 50 states. Um, you know, I'm from New Hampshire and there are prickly pears that are native to New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. Um, they're two parts of the prickly pear that are are quite tasty. The fruits, which are sometimes called tunas, um, make a delicious juice, a wonderful jelly or jam, um, and their color is an absolutely exceptional magenta, which almost looks like it shouldn't appear in nature. Um, Both the fruits and the pads can be quite prickly. So don't think that just because you're grabbing the fruit, you're not going to have to deal with the prickers because you will. And the best way to do that is to either hold the piece over the fire and let the um, let the spines and the glockids, and I'll come back to that in a minute, mm-hmm. burn off, or to take some strong gloves, hold it in one hand, and, and peel off the skin with a good vegetable peeler with the other. Um, on the prickly pear, the, the spines are, are very obvious. But the glockids often look like um, little fuzzy hairs at the base of each spine. And you think, oh, it's a cottony <laughs> little thing. I can touch that. And you can't. <laughs> yeah. They, they're barbed. They are sharp. And when they get into your skin, they're difficult to get out. So do, um, do be careful whatever part of the prickly pear you're working with. But that being said, it's, it's totally worth um, the work because not only do, do the fruits make a, a gorgeous and really tasty juice, something like a combination of a watermelon and an apple, but the pads, the nopales, um, are an excellent green vegetable. They taste, you know, it's so hard to describe one flavor in terms of another, but I would compare it favorably to a green pepper or a green bean. And you can, you can chop them up, use them in quiches, in stir fries. It's a very versatile vegetable. And something you can find in a lot of um, Mexican restaurants and yes. also canned, as I've seen it canned. Yes, I have too. I have mm-hmm. seen um, who, what there's some company that makes uh, canned nopales, and I've actually used them on pizza. So <laughs> it's, it's a yeah, yeah. You can you can buy them in the grocery store if you if you're curious and you don't want to go cut down your prickly pear or just cut one pad off of your prickly pear. Go to the grocery store and see if you <laughs> like them. And um, it it. it definitely seems to be a great idea to start eating some of our exotic invasive plants. And quite a few of them are edible. So um, talk about uh, some of your favorites uh, as far as taste is concerned and um, how you would prepare them. I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately because maybe because winter is getting to me and I'm thinking about spring already. But two of the earliest things that I forage for in spring are invasives. And one of them is Japanese knotweed, which Mm -hmm. is fallopia japonica. Um, And that usually comes up in New York City in about mid-April. And that's something that I confess I actually forage in the city parks. Now, I know I'm not supposed to pick anything in a city park, but I swear, Kim, if a ranger gives me a ticket for (laughs) pulling up Japanese knotweed, I will hit him with a knotweed stock because that plant is trying to take over the universe. Um, anybody who knows it, and, and a lot of people confuse it with bamboo because it does have that segmented stem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
knows that it's very difficult to get rid of. And I consider that I'm doing my part to help the world by pulling up just a little bit um, every spring. You, you want to get it while it's still tender enough to break off in your hand. It can get very fibrous as the season goes on, and it's it's still perfectly tasty, but at that point you need to peel it, and that's a lot of work. Um, but the young stems can be used as a rhubarb substitute. They have a lemony taste, and they can be used as a stir-fried vegetable or um, in jams as a rhubarb substitute, in pies as a rhubarb substitute. I also make a knotweed wine that is particularly delicious, if I do say so myself. Wow, that's that's impressive. I think <laughs> we all should be <laughs> preparing a lot more Japanese knotweed. Yeah. What's and another gar- invasive that um, that you particularly like? Well, garlic mustard. Um, and, you know, last year in... Maybe it was the beginning of May. I did a demonstration um, up in the Catskills, and I brought in a jar of must- garlic mustard in flour, and then I served people garlic mustard pesto, and they're like, "Oh, this is delicious! What is this?" And I I pointed to the flowers, and they were like, "I have that growing all over my yard." And I said, "Well, now you know what to do with it." Um, you know, there are communities that have great gatherings where people get together and pull up the garlic mustard because this is not only an invasive plant, but it's a plant that um, actually has an allelopathic effect mm-hmm. on the surrounding soil, you know, it produces a chemical that limits um, the growth of, of possible yes. competitors. So pulling it up by the roots and then taking the tender leaves into your kitchen is once again uh, doing the woods a favor. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really only at its most delicious in, in early spring and late fall. Um, but then it's it's so delicious. It, and it, it, if you're making a pesto out of it, um, you'll find recipes online that say, you know, use it instead of the basil and then add garlic to it. Ignore those recipes. Those people do not know what they're talking about. <laughs> Just use it instead of the garlic and the basil. And it's got a wonderful taste. You can, you can put it plain on bread as a bruschetta. You can stuff ravioli with it. You can put it on top of spaghetti. It, it's really tasty. And once again so abundant that you can really harvest as much as you want. That's great. And and do whoever the landover is a landowner is a favor by getting rid of it. Exactly. Yeah. And um one one more invasive that you like to eat. Okay, let me think of another invasive. Did you have something in mind? Um I think you had mentioned um did was it autumn olive? Oh yes I did mention autumn olive. I love that plant and I confess if I didn't have so much around me, I might have to plant it. Oh, oh I know I know people would cringe. <laughs> oh, and I dear. haven't. I haven't planted it. Um, and don't plant it. You shouldn't plant it. But its fruit is just delicious. Um, and especially high in lycopene. And I said I'm not a food scientist and I'm not a nutritionist. But a lot of studies have been done that show that, that autumn olive – is is very high in lycopene, and we all know that that's something that's good for us. Um, the thing that ha- is tr- tricky about autumn, ol- autumn olive is you don't want to pick it before it's fully ripe, because um, it's tart anyway. And if you if you put pick it in late August instead of late September, you will not enjoy the taste. Okay. But if you pick it in late September or even October, because they stay on the on the shrubs and trees for for quite a while, mm-hmm. you will have a juicy fruit that. Um, can be used in a lot of different ways. It makes a great jelly. Again, I, I make wine from it. But what I really love to do is make a, a sweet autumn olive bread that's like a banana bread. And the the color of the berries um, transfers to the cake. So you, you slice that loaf of bread or cake open and it's got a gorgeous rich pink color to it and a really unique flavor. Wow. Well, you, you've done a lot of experimenting with these. And um, I, I really can't wait to start trying some of these things in my own kitchen. Um, you've presented not only I hope a, will. <laughs> yeah, a lot of great native plants, but also how to use some of our bad boy invasives. I encourage listeners to pick up your book, which again is called Backyard Foraging, 65 Familiar Plants You Didn't Know You Could Eat, and that's published by uh, Story Publishing. And uh, Ellen, thank you so much for joining me today, and um, really, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Kim. This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful gardening tips to improve our environment, please visit us at www.ecobeneficial.com. <music> <music>